It's been said that history is written by the winners, and in today's episode, we're going to hear from the losers. Howdy, I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And by losers, I mean losers of World War I because All Quiet on the Western Front is told from that perspective, which separates it from most of the World War I movies you would see. Of course, the book is world famous and has given audiences for many years a perspective into the German mentality behind the lines of World War I. And this new version is really a fantastic adaptation that gives even more to the original story with the breadth of history and knowing that World War II was around the corner, something that was not known when the book was originally written. And I'm very pleased to have with us today the co-writers of this fine adaptation, Leslie Patterson and Ian Stokel. And without a doubt, they really wanted to make this movie and it took them years to get it made and they ended up being Oscar nominated along with the film's co-writer, director, Edward Berger, who ultimately did a rewrite on their script, and they supervised it. They worked as producers. They collaborated with Edward. And this is a fascinating conversation about what it took to get this adaptation made. So I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You know, you could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And folks, our Oscar issue is coming out any day now, and it's our 10th Oscar issue, and it's our 10th year of Backstory Magazine, so it all works out. If you've never read us, I hope you go check out the free issue at Backstory.net or in our app so you could see what we're about. And look, it would really mean a lot to me for my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and for my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page to support independent journalism by becoming subscribers. So thanks for considering. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview with co-writers Leslie Patterson and Ian Stokel about having their first screenplay produced, which became Oscar-nominated for Best Picture and Oscar-nominating them for Best Co-Writers for All Quiet on the Western Front. Okay, Leslie, Ian, it's good to see you. How you doing? Good. Great. See you. Awesome. We're using all of our technology today. Leslie's in a car, so this is all working. I'm on my personal hotspot because the rain's destroyed my Wi-Fi. Like, we're making it happen. We're putting it together. Well, so I want to give people a baseline of who you are, where you come from. Ian, let's start with you. At what age did you know you wanted to be a writer and did you go to school for it? It's funny because people keep asking me that and there was no point where I decided I wanted to write screenplays, but I've always been a storyteller, I think, is where it is. So I've always done short stories and novels and write songs. And at some point, which I'm not quite sure when, I went over to start writing screenplays plays probably about 30 years ago it's a long time ago and in terms of going to school I'd never been had any formal training until two summers ago when I signed up for UCLA's uh, professional program in producing that was one even though I was producing and then three weeks after that ended the professional program in screenwriting started and I'd never had any formal training so I thought okay well let's I'm there anyway. Let's let's do that. Which is a fantastic nine month course. You have to write two screenplays, um, and it's very useful. I found out then that my actual process is diametrically opposite to everybody else's, but that's fine. But there was a ton of great um, information and techniques and things that I learned from that. So I've never actually had. On this date, I wanted to do screenplays. It's just sort of drifted in many decades ago, or a few decades that's- ago. That's awesome. And we'll get into your habit in a little bit. But I just I got to ask, because, you know, this is both your first Oscar nomination. This is both your first produced screenplay for a feature film. You know, were you doing this producing and screenwriting class after All Quiet was already in production? It was two years ago, two and a half years ago. So, yeah, I guess it was already on the go. So, yeah, I mean, like I said, I've been doing it for so long, um, but it was actually... After it started production, maybe pre-production, that I, I I saw it and I just thought, yeah, let's do that. It's just down the road. So. That's awesome. Leslie, what about your past? When did you know that you wanted to be a writer? Yeah, so it was Ian that dragged me into it. It's all his fault. Um, no, but, but in all seriousness, I've always uh, been into film. So I studied my undergraduates and graduate studies in film and theatre. Where'd you go to school? Yeah, I went 
went to a big sports university in England to do my undergraduate. That's called Loughborough University. And I got a scholarship there as an athlete. I'm sure you know my sort of background as a professional athlete as well. But then I studied drama and film there, you know, was deep in the theory and, and loved every aspect of you know, theatre and film, to be honest, every aspect of storytelling. I mean, I even did costume design at one point. So wow. I think for me, it was always about sort of the entirety of a production and storytelling, the history of it, the theory of it. And then I did my graduate studies, my master's degree in theatre and film at San Diego State. And that's actually where Kathy Ke Kennedy studied, uh, which was cool. And I, you know, met, met with her a couple of weeks ago as uh, an alumni. So that was totally awesome but it, and it was through San Diego State to be honest I actually got into acting for the camera and that's what you know I sort of started off in was sort of the more performance side and that's probably an artifact of you know I'm an athlete I'm a performance person I was a dancer and I, that was just my conduit into storytelling but that's how I actually met Ian you know he was doing a film himself and I auditioned for him but then we, we became fast friends I think because of our big sport connections together and our love of the same kind of films and he said to me listen Les if you if you want to be successful as an actress you really need to write and produce your own films and I was like oh that's actually quite a good idea so that's when we sort of embarked on stuff together and I actually quickly realized one I, I'm not that great at acting but two I love to sort of write and produce and the the bigger side of film and that's what took me on this journey that's that's awesome and so you know I, I i know this is a a very boring question but i really want to lean into it for for our podcast listeners for a second what gave you guys the idea that you wanted to do an adaptation of all quiet on the western front it was made into a film before but not since 1930 it was a tv movie in the 1970s i think 79 it's been a radio play it's been a comic book what made you decide this century that you wanted to go after All Quiet on the Western Front and tell us about what it was like to get the rights just for 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 writers that have never done that before and getting your option? Boring. <laughs> no, it is. It's the most asked yeah. question, but I've got to, I've got to put it in there for the baseline. Well, I'll, t I'll take the kind of how we came about it and then maybe Ian can take the sort of getting the option because he was really the, the lead on that. But Great. both of us were very familiar with the novel I'd read it at school and Ian being in the military, which he'll talk about, you know, that novel was close to his heart. Um, and then we, when we were writing scripts together, there was a promotion on the book at the local bookstore and we both kind of picked it up and thought, gosh, no done this for a while we, we dug into the book again remembered how beautiful and poignant it was and thematically how it resonated with both of us in many different ways and then also just the uniqueness of it being told from the, the German perspective so all of those things we thought gosh you know wouldn't it be interesting if and that kind of led to Ian reaching out and I'll let him fill you in on that. Yeah, so uh, I basically found out who who had the rights or who owned it, which was NYU Press uh, in uh, New York, really just uh, contacted them to find out because we didn't expect the rights to be available. I mean, it's all quite nice and front, so you thought. And by chance, it, it was it was available. And so brought in a lawyer, and they jumped at it. And about three or four weeks after that, we had it. So it went pretty quick once once we identified that nobody had it. You know, and going back to that, um, why we would uh, why we'd do it. I mean, my genre is really action and ex-military British Army. And the personal side of that is my granddad, uh, granddad Reynolds on my mum's side, lied about his age, went to the Western Front. He was only 17. And then a few weeks after he got to the Western Front, uh, he was gassed with mustard gas and spent two years in hospital. We got photographs of him in hospital and he died in 52, I think, with uh, sort of uh, ailments related to the, the gassing, which he never recovered from. So it's a very personal thing. Uh, so as soon as I saw that, I thought, oh, wow, let's let's pursue this and you know, million to one chance, maybe it's available and it was available. And so we jumped at it straight away. So what year was that? When that was 2006, right? July 20th, yeah, July 20th, 2006, premiered at TIFF last September. So that was 16 years and two months, I think. I mean, that's that's awesome. And it's awesome that you guys stuck with it. There's there's something that happens sometimes when you get an option in which sometimes the rights holders get impatient 
if it's not going into a film fast enough. Now you're talking about a work that's very, you know, old already. So they were probably a little more patient with you. What were the challenges of continuing to renew your rights? Or was it just as simple as checking it once a year and sending a check? It was extraordinarily difficult. And uh, I think both Ian and I have developed relationships with any person that was in charge along the way. And and that ownership, you know, or, or sorry, the person in charge at NYU Press changed across the years as well. So we had to absolutely beg and plead our case every time, didn't we? Uh, I mean, we had to renew it basically every 18 months, I think. And then over the years, they were just, you know, we've been with you so long for you to get this off the ground. So whatever you say, you know, we'll go with because we trust you. We know you're going to get it done. And that was probably about 10 years in, you know. I mean, it's great because you are unproduced screenwriters at that point. And so, you know, again, it's very difficult sometimes for our listeners out there who are also unproduced to to get an option. But but the legitimacy of what the work was helps define your goals and you are clearly able to do a great job of it. So, I mean, it's it's just interesting to hear about those years and, and what it took for you guys to keep renewing your option. What were some of the war films that influenced you? Were, was there anything that you kind of had as an influence on well, your influence chart? Yeah, I was going to say, how many times have you watched Apocalypse Now, Ian? About 50 times, I think. Nice. It's one of my go-to. Whenever I watch a bad movie, which is often, first thing I do is I go straight back to Apocalypse Now and I watch Apocalypse Now. And by now I know all the words and I, it's like a Rocky Horror Show thing. You know, I can, only the I can theatrical the version, right? Only the yeah, theatrical really. version because I've watched all the other recuts and I just, the theatrical kills it over the other recuts. Well, I just got, I just got a... Uh, original five and a half hour uncut you know original film of um of apocalypse now i haven't watched it yet but i acquired that through ebay and that's all we're gonna say really <laughs> on on, five and a half on hour. Cassette or what what format was it in i was on a dvd i mean i don't know originally oh, okay, okay. you know so i haven't watched it yet interesting you know uh, it'll be in, it'll be super interesting to see you know, like when Redux came out and all that yeah. added stuff came in and you can see why they took it out, a lot oh of it. God, yeah. But then, you know, some of it is like, oh, that totally changed the story right there. It's nice to have a little more of Robert Duvall on the beach. But other than that, like the theatrical for me all the way. Well, so, all right. I, I want to know your your habit when you sit down to write. How important was outlining to your process? And, I, and I've asked you a few of these questions for Backstory Magazine, which, by the way, is where people could read your entire screenplay. We've, we've embedded it in the article there. But just for our podcast listeners, tell us about the art of adaptation, because you have a previous work. You're breaking down a book. Were you outlining it? Were you highlighting pages and then building yep. an outline from yep. that? Or what was your process of adaptation? Yeah. So Ian and I, the first thing that we did was we got a ton of copies of All Quiet and we essentially ripped them up into all the scenes and pinned them on a big board okay. uh, to really have a, a greater sense of the novel and maybe what scenes we would want to encompass. And then simultaneously, I think both of us, one of the most critical pieces about any historical film in my book any film is research because that's where your ideas come from that's where the foundational elements of any script are going to come from and for this it was absolutely imperative to understand the war in general the war from the german perspective we dug into things like trench diaries german trench diaries you know we were able to access a lot of academic materials it was ultimately through a deep understanding of the book and maybe some of the scenes that we felt were really critical the themes that we felt were critical and then through the research of course discovering the armistice being signed the last six hours of the war the historical context of you know the reparations that germany had to pay and ultimately you know the position of world war one and how it led into world war two and and that's ultimately where our other storyline came to us was through this research because ultimately when we looked at the book you know while beautiful this is almost like excerpts of a diary so we felt like we needed some kind of dramatic through line to give it some tension and, and momentum and we felt like the last six hours of the war gave it this wonderful ticking clock that could do that and then a juxtaposition of course between the upper brass and the everyman which we felt thematically represented a uh, the essence of of betrayal in the book. So those were a lot of the key things. I don't did, did I miss anything out, Ian? 
We optioned it in 2006. We started writing this first one, probably 2007. So the first thing we wanted to do is to try and stay true to the novel as much as we can. But you can't put everything in. You only got two hours, two and a half hours. So we identified really betrayal and futility of war as the two main ones from the book. But like Les said, we wanted to add something else to that, something that Remark didn't have, which was historical context. So in that first script that we did, we came up with the armistice and the railway carriages, which Les visited in France, actually. Uh, Campania, isn't it? Um, So she went there and actually saw it. And so that was really important that we added that. So that was the three themes we basically focused on, along with that six hours of the last uh, the last six hours, which is something we is in that original script as well that we put together way back in, you know, 18th century or whatever it was. Right. Uh, you know, when you guys sat down to write, would you write together or would you send each other scenes? No, we sat side by side, actually. I'm a big believer in in structure, probably Ian less so. So we kind of came together with some complementary skills and we we sort of beated out the story and the essence of it. And then we kind of sat side by side and really drilled down on each scene. And and I would say that, you know, I'm sort of more of a specialist probably in in things like character arcs and thematic essence. Uh, Ian is amazing at at action and sort of the visuals of it. So I think, you know, that combination of those skills allowed us to come up with something uh, that we felt was impactful. We don't we don't write together anymore. But back then it was, you know, we did we did. I mean, literally side by side, we were we were doing a lot of the stuff, you know, our process is uh, diametrically opposite, basically, but it worked for all quiet. That was for sure. When you sit down to write, how important is it that you hit certain page count each day versus how many hours you're sitting writing? Do you give yourself an hour number or a page count number or neither? There's no one way to do it. We were page count, weren't we? And I think because we're both, because we're both athletes, we're pretty goal driven. So we would definitely go for the page count. We'd give ourselves little treats to look forward to like, okay, if we do, you know, two pages, you know, sort of first thing in the morning and then. I remember we'd always go to the local Starbucks uh, and get a pumpkin scone with icing on it. <laughs> I don't know why, but I just remember that. <laughs> we used to do that, didn't we? Yeah, we do that um, all the time. Yeah. And then, and what um, was your goal then, for pages? How many pages did you want to get a day? I think we were five, were we? I think our goal was always about five pages a day, but give, yeah. or, give or take, I think as long as we kind of managed to squeeze out three, we would be moderately happy. But if I mean, we were but- having a a day where we sort of felt a bit stuck we would just go back to we had probably about 20 war films that we would just kind of go back and rewatch and think about it you know even like a very long engagement or saving private ryan or paths of glory or you know apocalypse now you know all of those just every classic movie that we could get das boot to anything that we could get our hands on we would just kind of keep rewatching and getting into the mindset I mean, page count can be um, very frustrating because it doesn't always flow. I mean, and, you know, it can not flow for days, you know. Now what I do is I try and work from 9 a.m. to noon on a screenplay, what, whatever you're doing, so, so long as it's screenplay related. And that takes a little bit of the pressure off. You don't just want to spew out stuff that hits your motivation, you know, in a negative way. But it worked with All Quiet that we were plowing through it. The scenes on the wall, we probably had 60 scenes up on the wall, pinned on the wall, that we had to get through and decide what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. So, you know, I mean, page count was important in that it just showed us that we can actually get through it, you know, but there's a lot of different ways of doing it for a screenwriter, obviously. How long did it take to get your first draft and how many pages was it? Well, we researched solidly for about eight months. And then I think it was probably another maybe four or five months to come up with a first draft. But we went through many different drafts and many different storylines before we found the one that worked. Yeah, I wouldn't say that would be a first draft. That was like the pre-first draft sort of thing, you know. Right. It was it was a few drafts later that we came up with something that we thought, oh, OK, this this may may work, you know. Trial and error, I think, wasn't it? As a lot of the time. And we're, we're never scared to get rid of stuff that doesn't work. I mean, that's really important for writers. A lot of people are terrified of getting rid of stuff. And it's like, well, if it doesn't work, you got to just throw it out and start again or pick a point where you can start again, you know, partway through maybe. And just you can't be afraid of throwing out work that doesn't work. You can't cling on to stuff. 
That's great advice. I, you know, I'm curious, you have very detailed action. Tell us about how your action looks on the page, because there's this trick that you could do in which you try and make it look a little more haiku, uh, a bit more white space makes it easier for the reader. But at the same time, you do have to convey what's going on in the scene. But, you know, readers sometimes slow down if they see a big paragraph. So it's difficult. And you have multiple battle scenes with a lot of action. So so tell us about forming your action on the page and how it looks. I mean, for me, I, I put a lot of detail in. I and mean, there's two reasons for that. One is your words or your voice. And I uh, it gets me upset when people say you got to cut down. You know, your words or your voice, you take away your words, these words, and you're taking away my voice. So I'm always going to object to that. In terms of actually writing, I watch um, what I write on a screen, a big screen in my head. So when I'm writing action, I'm watching the action and then I'm writing it down from what I see. So sometimes it can get very detailed. But on the other hand, I like the detail, you know, because I, I'm I'm trying to bring people on a journey that I'm I'm watching at the same time. I'm not doing a, you know, eventually you cut down so much, you could, AI could do it, you know, a chimpanzee could do it, it, it given enough time because there's hardly anything on the page or any detail, you know. So I would always, you know, defer towards more detail than less. But it is purely that I'm watching it on the screen. That And then I, I'm actually writing as I'm watching. So when we make changes back then, I would have to watch the changes in my head to make the change. And then you can make the change, you know. Yeah, I mean, sim similar to Ian, you know, I would say I probably like a little bit more of a white page because it is quite dense to to read as a reader. But I would say that the, the script morphed and changed, especially as Ed came in as a director. You know, it's easier to have more detailed action when you know, the director is involved in a rewrite because, you know, the film's already off and going. So you're not worried about a reader reading yeah. the action. Yeah. This is now a director that's visualizing it in his head. So he took the action that we already had and just kind of embedded some of his own stuff in it as well. But yeah, I think action is a difficult one because if you're writing for readers, then big, dense pieces of, of text, I mean, it's a challenge. And also, as well as a writer, you want to leave room for a director to sort of envisage their own sense of that. So it's like it's it's difficult because you want a bit of both, right? You you need detail and action, but at the same time, not so overwhelming that a reader can't get through it. You can't get it to a director. So it's it's yeah, it's a, a difficult balance, I think. Absolutely. I you know I want to get to the spoiler section in a second here, but I just want to hear the lineage of of your drafts. We talked about your your pre first draft. Once you got your first draft, tell us about like how long it took you to get a draft that you really were comfortable enough that there weren't really going to be more changes, and then your work was really just papering the town, getting it to anybody that would read it until you finally got it to Edward. So tell us about that kind of process we're not precious about a first draft you know we're we're both producers as well so we know that is actually the starting point and not the end point and we know it's going to change so you know for the better as, as soon as we see it's for the better that there's changes we're 100 on board so you know it was never actually this is the first draft and this is it you know it there was a point where okay this is it for now and we're taking this out but, you know, we always understood that, uh, you know, it's going to change. It's a script. It's a starting point for the whole thing. I think as well, like to come up with a draft we felt really comfortable with. We had a lot of friends uh, look at it. We had a lot of feedback. We, you know, we went to kind of some script people that we really believe in, some readers. Sure. We had a lot of input to get it to the point where, you know, we, we felt really good about getting it out. And that was probably about two years. So yeah, it was it was a sizable amount of time, but it's a difficult thing to get right, adapting something of this nature. No, of course. But so so then tell us about the years of getting it around town. Did you have anybody before Edward that maybe was interested and then it just kind of fell apart? Or was it not until oh, yeah. you, you, you met with Edward Berger, who became your co-writer and director, that there was just nothing until you guys had that connection. It was continuous. You know, it, it was never put in a drawer. I mean, literally, we contacted through emails and, and meetings and, and phone calls. I mean, literally, it was thousands of people, thousands yeah. of contacts. I mean, and it was 
over 10 years, it was like 12 years before Edward and Netflix came on board, 12 and a half years. So that whole time, right from when the we first had it, went to London, set up, a, what was it, about a dozen meetings, and we didn't even have a script at that point. And everybody went, well, where's the script? <laughs> well, we don't have it. You know, but then it was just relentless. You just have to be relentless, I think. And I think as well, like we had a a specific strategy to start with, you know, because, of course, we were very much in the outside, right? So how do you access talent when nobody will either return your calls or you're not known at the agencies, you don't have an in? So we had to really strategically think about it. And, of course, 16 years ago, the landscape was very, very different. Uh, yeah. getting a German speaking language film off the ground for that kind of budget would have been impossible to raise the finance for that. Plus a World War One. World War One was not a war that was covered so much 16 years ago because, you know, right. cinema was very much American dominated and thus World War Two dominated. So, you know, our first foray into it was okay this is going to have to be English speaking to raise the finance in German accents but let's maybe go to some of the bigger German directors and try and see if you know we can get some traction there and to be honest a lot of them were pretty pretty scared of the material you know because it's a huge undertaking and we had uh, a German director that's that's now bigger now and a very close friend of ours Anna Forster she was one of the first people we had on board she was a wonderful cinematographer at the time turned director so but she was not big enough to move the needle. So it was like every step of the way, we were trying to get elements attached to the script that we we thought could further it. But we were learning as well as producers in terms of what actually are people worth. IMDb doesn't always reveal everything. Um, You know, all of those things, right? So we had various directors attached along the way, various casts attached along the way, different producers attached along the way, one of which went to prison. Um, I mean, on and on and on. Um, Yeah, it was wild. You know, it's interesting because aside from this being a war movie, it's told from the army that lost World War One. So I'm sure there weren't a lot of Germans rushing to tell this story, but the minute you changed it to be a German language film, it has a more poignant effect. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about Das Boot a lot, which was the first time that I had seen a movie from the German perspective about in that film losing World War II. And the hat trick there was that if it's good storytelling, which Das Boot absolutely is, you care about these people. Even though they're Nazis, you want them to be okay. You you're you're with them biting your nails when they're trying to repair their submarine. And it's the same thing in All Quiet on the Western Front, in which, you know, you want him to be okay. You want him to live. And it it's just a great reminder about how absolutely stupid war is for all sides. Because Yeah, that's you know, yeah, that's absolutely it. And at the end of the day, this is a story about the everyman. Right. Whether it's from the German perspective or not, it's about those young men that were betrayed by the upper brass. Yeah. And that continues to go on. And I think that's why people can relate to it. But, you know, when Ed and Malta got hold of our script and reached out to us, uh, and this was kind of three three years ago, and, and suggested, let's do this in German language. Of course, the whole landscape had changed where that was a possibility. Parasite had won for best film, best right. foreign film. That that told us that the market is there. Sam Mendes had done 1917, so World War One was a lot more in the zeitgeist. Yep. So, and then Netflix was huge, you know, and incredibly supportive of local content. So when they came to us and pitched that, we were like, oh my God, this is awesome. Absolutely, this is the way it should be. So I think it really is sort of timing and the right visionary behind the project that has all come together at the same time. So we've we've been incredibly lucky, you know, uh, and we're we're very grateful. I mean, to have, you know, both both Ed and Malta, I mean, so, so talented, you know, so. What was the budget in the schedule? Um, I think we're allowed to to mention it now, but but it was, let's just say it was under 30, um, wow. which is pretty unbelievable yeah. for for what was achieved. And Especially it goes all the special effects. I mean, there's so oh. much digital sets and, and effects with, you know, the, the acts of war. So it was under 30 and how long was the ske- shooting schedule? It was 52 days, 52. Yeah. All right. 
Well, so podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page where you could see these Zooms, you could see Ian and Leslie right now talking to you. <laughs> um, press pause if you have not yet seen All Quiet on the Western Front. It's in your pocket. Go see it. Don't be silly. Don't watch it on your phone. Watch it on a big screen. It deserves the big screen treatment. And come back if you have not yet seen it. And you're scared of spoilers because we are getting into spoilers right now. I, I think the easiest place to start is to talk us through your involvement after Edward Berger came on as writer director, because this is a place that's very scary for screenwriters in which sometimes they're discarded and the director no longer wants to collaborate. But from everything I've seen and read, it seems like there was still a very collaborative air between you and Edward. So tell us about navigating that and staying relevant as Edward, of course, transformed it into the German language and added some of his very own memorable scenes as well. Well, I think from, from our perspective, as I said before, I think uh, Les and I are both producers as well. And our best case scenario as writers and producers would be the, the director you bring on makes that script and that story their own. Yeah. So when Edward and Mol Molka came on board and said it's German and it's from the German perspective, we were 100% on board because it needed something new, I think, a, a different perspective to make it so successful. So, you know, uh, a big part of that was his vision coming to fruition. And we were absolutely fine with that. And, you know, we had some great meetings with him and, you know, uh, we did some more passes on the script and then he needed to take that ownership and go away and do his draft. And we were just incredibly supportive. And what he came up with was, to be honest, incredible. And we just, you know, you put your ego aside, right? And you say, there's many aspects of the script that we couldn't have told because it had to be done by a German. That sense of shame that is imbued within the film. Some of the more finer dialogue pieces. There's a rhythm and a pacing to the German dialogue that's different that we, Ian and I, couldn't have brought to the table. So, you know, there's certain aspects like that. And I think equally, there's other aspects that he couldn't have done. And I think the historical context is definitely one piece of it. And I've said a couple of times, that's maybe why this film uh, is really appealing to a wider audience, because you do have the outside in perspective that Ian and I brought and then the inside out perspective that Ed brought. And that's what people are responding to. After living with it for so long, what surprised you the most about his script when you saw some of the changes that he made? What what made you giddy when you're reading the pages and, you know, you think you know this story, but he's he's done a rewrite that that that's really getting you jazzed up? I think for me, it's how he hangs on moments. One of my most favorite things that he added in were the the letters, the latrine moment between Paul and Kat. So the development of that relationship was really beautiful. The other piece was the scarf. You know, he had a couple of just gorgeous, gorgeous moments uh, between the lads. I thought that was incredible. There was many moments, you know, and, it, and to be honest, for us as well, to see the first cut of the film as writers to see what is left out where space is given where things are tightened up in the edit with the music all of that i think that for both of us that was probably a big aha moment in terms of how we move forward as writers i mean there's a, there's a couple of points very quick that i really <laughs> related to as i say i'm ex-british army i was in northern ireland in the late 70s went over there as a Royal Engineer Specialist Search Team. And part of what we did uh, was before bomb disposal went in anywhere, we had to go in, I was 19 at the time, we had to go in uh, to clear everything for booby traps. And there's a couple of points where in the film, Paul is just looking at everything unfold in front of him. He's just quiet. And you can see that look. And I totally related to that look because there was, there was plenty of times in Ireland where, you know, you're clearing a derelict building. You look, you're standing at the door and you know there could be booby traps there. And there's a hundred things that you need to move or to check. And any one of them could be a problem. And you're, you're standing at the door and you're thinking, this could end really, really badly for me. And that look from Paul a couple of times where he's just looking at the battlefield and it's and it's all unfolding. You can see that, you know, boy, I'm screwed here. I could be screwed. Right. I felt that. I felt that before in my life. And as soon as I saw that, it was like, a oh, 
okay, <laughs> that was a bit of a PTSD, but that was that was very much a, a personal. Wow, I've been there. Didn't like it. Don't want to go back. Type thing, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was a very visceral film. It really puts you into the mindset of the experience. You know, one of the things that's also interesting about it is most people are used to war movies that have a mission, and here it's pretty much hold the line. And as you say in the final title of the film, the line didn't move too much over the entirety of World War One, and so many lives were lost just defending the line. What were the challenges of keeping? what they were actually doing interesting because it allowed your movie to instead be a great character study of just what Paul is experiencing and seeing because he's kind of just blowing in the wind, going wherever he's ordered to, not always sure of what he's doing, which is also a very realistic look at war from the perspective of a lowly infantryman. Yeah, I think for us, it was it was definitely hard. And I think that Ed helped a bunch with that because he really visualized how that would appear on screen as a director. But furthermore, sort of why Paul, our protagonist, could not be a hero and why it was not an adventure, I think that that really harkens to that German sensibility again. For us, I felt like the blowing in the wind of Paul, you know, our counterpoint of the armistice storyline gave us that dramatic tension so that an audience could feel a sense of that sort of ticking clock and that tension through that storyline and then allow them to sort of really dig into that senselessness back on the battlefield. So I think it really that juxtaposition of those both storylines allowed for for that that blowing in the wind to, to really exist and things not get bogged down in it too much. Yeah, I mean it was it was a great mentor aspect as well for what we see between Kat and for Paul. And that existed in the book and I know that you both expanded it and then Edward expanded it as well. So on a character study level, that mentorship that, that you know, Kat is giving Paul to try and keep him alive is fascinating. But then towards the, the you know, the third act, we're seeing that, you know, as, as, they, as it's clear to everyone that the war is ending, Kat's nervous about going back to civilian life where he's just yep. a shoe cobbler and he right. doesn't have this great authority and isn't revered by everyone. And he's, he's really nervous about it. And I thought that was that was a nice, intimate moment as well. That, that I really appreciated. It comes full circle, and I think that one of the things, obviously, that we, we didn't have time in the story to go back to was a home front, and that is a big piece of the novel, is that these men could no longer go home. They would not fit in anymore. So, you know, other parts in the script had to be imbued with that sensibility, and I think that that was perfectly encapsulated within Cat's art. And one of the most beautiful scenes in the film is uh, is Paul and Kat talking? You know, is it snowing and they're and they're walking and they're talking about Christmas and going home and yeah, it's just it says so much in a short space of time. So uh, yeah. Ooh, hey, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You know, you could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And folks, I hope you check us out because our Oscar issue is coming out any day now. It's our 10th Oscar issue because it marks the 10th year of Backstory Magazine existing. So your support means everything to us. You could read the free issue if you've never read us before over at Backstory.net or via the Backstory app so you could test drive us. But if you like what you see, I hope you consider becoming a subscriber. And just to sweeten the deal, I'd like to offer you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a subscription to Backstory Magazine, which you could get over at Backstory.net, and your login credentials will work over at Backstory.net and also on an iPad. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom interviews go, it would really mean a lot to me to have you become Backstory Magazine subscribers. So thanks for considering. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right back into our interview with Oscar-nominated screenwriters Leslie Patterson and Ian Stokel about their screenplay for All Quiet on the Western Front. Tell us about the armistice, because I was I, I thought that was interesting that you went for a complete 
POV change and you showed the negotiation of the end of the war, it helps you with your ticking clock because the film's end is based on those last few hours at the end of the war. But what what gave you the idea to spend as much time as you did on it? I like that you did. It just it was it was interesting. I didn't expect it. When we originally did it, you know, that's what we both felt was missing. That sort of, you know, as Les said earlier on, it's, it really is more like a journal. Right. Yeah, yeah. And it sort of plays out over, what is it, three years, I think, in the book. And that, for us, was what was missing when people say, well, how is it relative today? Well, obviously, it's relative. But just just that whole element of historical context, which led to you know, what was to come 20 years later was it was a big part of what we wanted in there. Well, I think as well, when you look at, you know, when Remark wrote this book, of course, World War II had not happened. So we are viewing it from a different lens. Right. And so when it comes to an adaptation, an adaptation exists through the lens of which you've lived. And for Ian and I, we felt like that context was so critical because really this is not something that we're taught in school. We're taught about World War One, and we're taught about it from our perspective. And so to understand the crushing implications that the Allies placed on Germany was a shock to me as a British person. I had no idea about this. And I felt it was a very potent thing to to put in that could uh, give a sense of empathy yeah i, I mean historically the they, they thought that they were doing such harsh rules against germany to end all wars because that's what they thought right. world war one was the war to end all wars but right. in effect they went way too far to the point that right. the germans you know as we all know within a generation rose back up against it and there were more problems <laughs> to say the least right. There's a and they, and they, always, they always say, you know, history is told by the victors. Right. You know, and you can definitely see that this was one case where it really was told by yeah. the victors. You know. and, but at the same time, I'm not sure that a lessening of the armistice would have averted World War II either, to be brutally honest. But but get, getting to no, a scene that it, is yeah. really hard on the page, just because I know we're, we're short on time, That that is really, I want to hear more about, you know, it's one thing to write action. It's another thing to write good dialogue. But you have a scene that is just pure emotion, and that's when Paul stumbles upon the French soldier in the bombed-out crater. There's no talking, pretty much. It's just man versus man. Paul gets the upper hand, severely stabs the French soldier, and then feels guilt for what he's done because he's literally stuck in this crater having to watch this man die in front of him not shoot from a distance like they're used to but watch this man die in front of him and he tries to save him and even though knowing that he tries to save him the man might come back and try and kill him he still tries to save him and realizes it's futile there's no dialogue between these two what were the challenges of that scene on the page that was in the book so that was a remark thing that we didn't come up with that but yeah writing it was we had to find the beats of that scene that could allow room for the emotionality and so you know a couple of the aspects of it the putting the dirt in the mouth I don't believe that was in the book finding the pictures when that happened how that happened they were not explicitly written out in the book so I think it was Again, sort of understanding the scene in the book, why it was there, why it was important, and then condensing it down and finding the beats to take you through the scene, but at the same time, allowing enough room for that emotionality there. And that's a critical thing as a screenwriter, I think, is not doing too much, allowing for the acting to to come forth, allowing for the direction to come forth. I mean, when we ended up watching that scene, I think that's probably one of my most favorite scenes in the film. It's the most impactful scene I think I have ever seen because Ed is so brave in how long he sits with those moments. Yeah. I mean, it's excruciating and, you know, you want the hell out of there and he doesn't let you do it. And that's the whole point. And then obviously Felix, I mean, is so incredible. So, you know, that, that yeah. scene came to life through the the direction, the editing and the acting. It's interesting because we talked about this for the Backstory Magazine article, and I just want to briefly get back to to your reaction to it and, and what, if anything, Ed told you about it. Because you had mentioned that it was an invention of Ed's. Something that really, you know, grabbed me was this 
this this concept of stealing the goose from the farm. And when Kat and Paul do that, it's this fun, silly thing. They steal a goose. They get to rejoice. They have their little victory with all their friends of a good meal. And then they go back later on as the war is even worse. And it's it's a great analogy to life of kind of, I can say it now, don't go back to stealing the goose too many times because maybe the first time is the best because things do not end well. And that's the scene where Kat gets killed. And it, it, you know, it's everything metaphorically of Germany trying to relive glory days and it working out bad. And I'm just curious what your reaction to it was when you saw it and what discussions, if any, you had with Ed about it. Because I know it was something you mentioned that he added that I, I just really loved. From my perspective, and a lot of it is lost from people that aren't veterans, I think. There's a lot of comedy in those sort of intense moments. And when I got out in 79, I think it was, I actually wrote an article in the New Statesman uh, that was published in 79 about the comedy that we actually went through while we were in Ireland under those intense pressures. And it's it's called gallows humor, right? I mean, the Brits Brits are totally good at gallows humor. Uh, We've got a history of it. And and that, for me, the getting the goose, that – that was very much on the fringe of gallows humor. And it was very army type of incident that, uh, you know, anybody that's been in can relate to that sort of that's that sort of environment. The goose is actually in the book as well. That's a really iconic scene in the book is them catching a goose and cooking it up for the for the rest of their mates. But so they, that catch always- it, they catch it in the book, right? They don't steal it from they a do. farm. They don't steal it from a farm. Right. I think they catch it. So that was definitely added to 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 bring in that tension, and then obviously the full circle of going back and the young French boy. That was an addition of Ed's, which I think is really really powerful and adds another layer to it. Well, right, because it gives a different death for Cat rather than just you know in the middle of war. It gives a much different context to his death, which was fascinating. What, yes. what was this? What was the scene that was uh, something that was lost in editing that you kind of missed, but you understand why it was lost. It's always interesting to hear about those. We had a little bit more towards the end with the French side when they now know that the attack is coming and the tension of that, that last attack. We had a little bit more on the French side. So we had developed that main character, Grenoir, we had called him. So we had a bit more development of him to kind of set him up and that was lost. But again, things have to be lost, right? Because there's other things that are added. So we certainly weren't bothered about that. Uh, Rightly so. I think, you know, taking that out was was a good move (laughs) from this perspective. You know, we're not precious about what we write and what's in there. It's like if it works, then we're on board. Was there something that... um that you were needing to rewrite and collaborate with Edward of any sort of a rewrite during production? And how often were you on set? Well, this is a kind of a bummer for Ian and I because of COVID. The film was shot at the height of COVID and we were in LA, so we were not able to get to set, which was pretty traumatic for us, but not even Netflix executives were allowed on set. It was sure. incredibly closed down. So we were just in communication, you know, online, on Zoom and so on. You know, we were showing some dailies and and how the thing was progressing. But that's another bonus about having Ed as a writer, right? He's there and he's on the ground and he's working with the actors. But certainly moving forward, you know, Ian and I, you know, that was always our big passion was to be on set to see how it came together. But, you know, we'll take how the film is is gone, that's for sure. I mean, that really was one of the worst aspects of the film because we've been developing it for you know 16 years or 15 years at a time uh, and we'd always talk about being on set it's one of the things we really wanted we understood it that we couldn't be on there but uh it was hugely disappointing i mean what year was it filmed in 2021 early 20 it was just there was a early massive out, out, yeah early 21 uh, late 2020, early 2021. So there was not there even was... vaccinations out yet. No, so, yeah. no, it was brutal. And that's where Netflix, I mean, they were so clever. They were so on point with the protocols that they had in place. Yeah. That's why they were able to film so many films the way they did. I mean, 
we had what 300 extras and all sorts i mean it was yeah. a very complicated film shoot and we did not have to shoot down once and that's testament to netflix protocols malta as a producer but what it meant was there's people like us that could not be a part of it so you know again but, you just kind of have to suck it up <laughs> yeah i mean it's it's producing 101 and that's uh, first rule is always get the film made yeah you know that that's it so whatever you have to do as producers we knew that you know that's that's the that's the roll of the dice really I, I know we're running out of time what was your toughest scene what was the scene that you came back to on the page over and over and how did you creatively rise to the challenge for me personally it would probably be the headmaster scene at the start of the film to make it seem authentic no authentic is the wrong word for an audience to relate to it because it is in a different era and to imagine that we would get caught up in that fervor with that type of language it seems quite stilted and old-fashioned so i think that was one of the hardest ones to write but then when you watch how ed directed it with a different kind of energy um yeah, that was a huge learning curve because it really worked. And yeah. what worked was how it was shot, how it was edited, how it was acted, all of those things together. Um, but writing that was a challenge, I felt. Individually, a small one would be the death of uh, Albert, I think, with the flamethrowers. Uh, we had that originally much earlier on in the script, and it was moved way back more. I mean, and rightly so, but it was still that... You know, you could totally relate to the pain of of Paul, you know, and it's the start of the industrialization of uh, of war, really. Yeah. You know, that that was sort of hard to write because it was Albert, you know. <laughs> yeah. like, uh, well, we're going to talk more about your film in the 15th Annual Screenwriting Nominees podcast because I, I definitely want to get into the starting and ending points of this film and that. But I, I really appreciate you both being so generous with your time. I love what you did on All Quiet on the Western Front. Of course, congrats on being Oscar nominated on this, your first produced screenplay. Ian, Leslie, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate good, you. Good, uh, all good, your support. good to be here. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to Oscar nominated screenwriters, Leslie Patterson and Ian Stokel for being so generous with their time and chatting about their Oscar nominated film, All Quiet on the Western Front. And folks, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And if you've never read us before, you could test drive us, see what's inside and read the free issue over at Backstory story.net or through our app and you know we're just days away from our oscar issue coming out it's our 10th oscar issue because backstory has existed for 10 years thanks to your generous support of course i want to make it easy for you to subscribe so i'm giving you discount coupon code save five that's save and the number five and that will save you five dollars off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. And look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page support my passion project. So thanks again for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2023 all rights reserved. I'm a pretty easy to get a hold of fella. So if you want to follow me on social media, you could find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter or those same handles work for Instagram as Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. I also have a Facebook fan page. You could reach out there as well. And you could also write in anytime to BackstoryLetters at gmail.com and I will do my darndest to get back to you as soon as I can. I'm just Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you again for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.